everyone. Welcome back to the show. Today we're talking with Anne Moss Rogers, who is an advocate, uh, a TEDx speaker, and an author. Anne, welcome to the show. Thank you so much for coming on. Well, thank you so much for having me. Um, it's nice to get to visit Canada, even if it's by podcast. <laughs> yeah, well, it's a decent uh, weather. It's starting finally to warm up here, which means no more snow, so that's a good thing. Yeah, it, it definitely. It's just 95 here today. So Where are you? Uh, Richmond. Virginia. Okay, holy smokes, that's warm. Yes, it is. But you know, um, I do okay in the heat. Um, I don't like the cold. Uh, you're like me. I always say I was born in the wrong country. This is not for me, this winter thing. Yeah, and I, you know, since I've lost a child to suicide, I struggle in those dark winter months. Yeah. Just a little bit more because there's less light and you know January and February are months to be endured yes absolutely absolutely you okay yeah yeah I'm just swallowing I had radiation yes and, uh, brain tumor, and so swallowing can be difficult sometimes are you feeling any better with that the swallowing isn't a lot better the voice is I mean, that's still kind of, since it's been restored, it's kind of a low, sexy Hollywood voice instead of my <laughs> former voice, but I'll take it. I love the accent, by the way. Oh, I have an accent. Oh my God, you still have an accent, like from the South accent. <laughs> <laughs> I thought I'd gotten rid of that, but I guess I No, have. you still have it. It's great. Okay. Part of my charm, I hope. What's that? Part of my charm, I hope. It is, certainly. Okay, so tell me about Charles. I... Well, thank you for asking. First of all, I love to talk about him. He was my youngest son, and he was the funniest, most popular kid in school. So he was that kid when he walked in, the whole room lit up, and they were always glad to see him. He always had a big crowd around him. And he was the guest everybody wanted at their at their party. Um, or their the party. So he's he was that kind of... So he was the last person anybody expected to suffer from depression and end up killing himself. Yeah. And I noticed a lot of traits when he was younger that alarmed me. One is that he could never get filled up. You know, it was just never enough. So if we went to a fun event, you know, after we got back, he was like, well, can we do this next? Like we went to a theme park one time at King's Dominion, which is a theme park here. Roller coasters, everything. And there weren't a lot of lines that day. And he took a friend. We were there all day long. It's 90 degrees. I have four kids with me. And I'm trying to keep up with Charles, who is just, you know, because there's no lines. He's on every ride. And this poor kid, he's dragging behind him. It's just like about to <laughs> about to pass out. We get home at 5 o'clock. We've been there all day. And he goes, can we go to um, Williamsburg to their theme park? And I said, well, that'd be a great thing to do. Let's do that in about a couple weeks. What do you think? He goes, no, I mean now. And I'm like, we just got back. We got to eat dinner. Well, can, okay, can I have so-and-so and so-and-so and so-and-so to dinner? I'm like, honey, I don't even know what we're having for dinner. Well, you can make it for them too. I'm like, what can I whip up for three people is different from what can I whip up for, you know, extra guests. Yeah. I mean, I can't even pick myself up out of a chair. And then he just, he just would keep going like, well, maybe just Jacob and can they spend the night? And it was just, he didn't like being alone and I didn't realize part of why he didn't like being alone was that he was overtaken by his thoughts of suicide and by keeping people around him at all times that was kind of his strategy for survival mm -hmm. and it's a strategy I don't know that it's the all-time best strategy because I don't think you can always be surrounded by people and be on all the time. You've got you've got to have that downtime. So he wrote about his pain and lyrics, rap music lyrics. Mm -hmm, I've read some of them. He's incredibly talented. Yeah, that. he was a very good writer and he had a great turn of phrase. And he was an up, uh, up and coming rap star. So he was starting to get some traction. And unfortunately, we went through wilderness, therapeutic boarding school. And when he came back, he came back to the state, ranked 49th for treating childhood major depression, and nothing had changed. And there weren't resources for that type of child. I don't know that there ever would be for him. I, I don't know that, but it hadn't changed. And he ended up becoming addicted to heroin. We didn't know about it, but because he snorted it. I didn't even know it could be snorted. 
And we knew about it like the last 30 days of his life. And he took his life while going through uh, withdrawal from heroin. And it was just not expected to us. Um, nobody had ever talked about suicide with us. And what's more, you know, nobody ever really even said, let's get a diagnosis. We did get one eventually when we sent him to wilderness, which we had to have a son kidnapped out of his bed. And, and that's, as a parent, that's not, that's not plan A. No, of course, I can't imagine. You know, he's angry. I can understand him being angry. But his life was at risk. Before he was kidnapped, he was doing some really scary drugs. And he had broken into a store, which none of this stuff was like him personally. And I didn't know what was going on. And because he was abusing so many substances by then, we, we couldn't get a mental health di diagnosis at that point. And after his death, I decided to go public. Um, I, nobody was talking about it. And the reason I didn't know my son was suicidal was because of the silence. I mean, he put classic I am suicidal signs on social media. Hundreds of people saw it. And nobody recognized it as such, including me. I thought when I read, if I died, no one would notice for 30 days was one of them. When I read that, I thought, oh, with the drug addiction, he's about to hit rock bottom. I think that must indicate that. Of course, I don't know what really the definition of rock bottom is. Right. Nobody. Yeah. And so I thought he's going to ask for help. And when he called me, he was asking for help. He just wasn't asking, hey, mom. I want you to come get me. I need help. And for whatever reason, I expected it to be put in that pretty package with a bow on it. And it wasn't. And he did hit rock bottom. And when his rock bottom was ending his life. And we were shocked. <laughs> and now I look back and, you know, you have a lot. You have 20-20 vision on the look back. Hindsight is priceless. Yeah, it is. It is. So that's when I decided to write the newspaper article, start the blog, and the newspaper article went viral, and all of a sudden I had an audience for the blog. And they were encouraging me to write a book, so I wrote a book. But I will tell you that taking the step out into public with this subject and telling everybody about my story was, was literally terrifying. No, I can imagine. I can't imagine. But you're I, so proud of yourself, honey. I was so scared. And when I wrote the newspaper article, the editor calls to tell me that it published. And in, instead of feeling proud, I felt terrified because I hadn't shown it to anybody but one person to get them to proof it. I didn't show my husband. I didn't tell my mother. <laughs> and there it was. It was going to be in the Sunday paper. Oh, my gosh. I was... I thought, oh, my God, my client's going to walk out on me. My business partner is going to regret ever having partnered with someone who had such a screwed up family. People would judge me that I'm a terrible mother. And quite frankly, Jody, all of that could have happened. It was a risk that that could have happened, but it didn't. Instead, I found support of other people who were going through what I was going through. So people were reading their story in mine and I kept getting people saying you're so strong and I'm like I've just told you in this newspaper article that I'm falling apart how can that be strong so it took me a long time to realize that that was the way people saw it and I still am confused by that it, but it takes a great deal of courage to open yourself up um on paper funding on in person is another thing, or behind a podcast is another thing, because you're still hiding, but you've done all of it. Yeah. So I'm very, I'm, very proud of yourself, because you've literally conquered all of those fears. It wasn't easy, but I think that somewhere internally, somebody was pushing me out on the stage, and that was where Charles was most comfortable on stage, so when I'm out there, I feel him with me. So the first time I did it, I was kind of addicted. <laughs> You know, I, I'd lost my child, and when I stood on stage, I felt him with me. Mm -hmm. And who wouldn't want to feel that? Oh, for sure. And yeah. be able to help people. Right. And then I get 
you saved my life last night. And at one point, I spoke to a YMCA audience. And the, one of, a couple of the moms brought their teenagers. And one said that she emailed me after the event. And she said, I had intended to email you because I was mad at you for talking about what you did when I felt like I wasn't adequately warned because I brought my child. Mm -hmm. my teenager and she said but I'm not angry and here's why so she got in the car after that event and her son turned around he said mom there's something I need to tell you I've been thinking of suicide and I have a firearm eating he said I have a gun and she was so shocked and so thankful and she of course wasn't angry but she's what she indicated to me is what people struggle with before they know. And that is that if I bring my child, it'll give them the idea. And, you know, or I'll put the idea in his head. It's the worst misconception. It is. And most parents think that. And so sometimes I have to fight against that. So when I speak at women's conferences, Lots of times they'll want the pain into purpose because now they've heard about it and they'll ask for that one specifically. But for some conferences, it don't, I'll disguise the topic. You know, how do you keep yourself together and project a professional image? And I'll kind of go in with titles like that and reconstruct my story in a way that shows my struggle while he was struggling and how I fought to maintain my business and a professional image, you know, which I didn't really, but that's kind of the point of the topic. But I have to mask, I have to mask the topics and say, okay, what are people looking for? What do they want? And how can I spin my story to fit that mold in order to reach the people that I need to reach, which these days is most of the people in that audience. Somebody has been touched by suicide, touched by addiction, has lost somebody to suicide, knows somebody who struggles, they struggle themselves. In fact, I can usually, if I'm close enough to the audience, I can pick out in those sea of faces people who've attempted before. And I, uh, just the other night I did, and I asked a woman, I said, are you okay? And she goes, you know, don't you? And I said, I do. And I said, why don't you tell me your story? Because I'm listening. And, you know, we had a really nice conversation. She'd never told another living soul. She felt shame. And I think that shame has a lot to do with the way our culture is. Mm -hmm. Making people feel weak. When, in fact, if you think about it, enduring these thoughts over and over and fighting through it, what courage and strength that must take. I don't know. I've never had thoughts of suicide. But after reading my son's work, I'm like... It's exhausting because it feels never-ending. It feels like there's just never going to stop. Right. Exactly. And then that ideation, the really intense part, appears to last about 20 minutes for most people, 15 to 20. And how the young people have described it is that it has two peaks. It kind of starts off slowly and then peaks where it just feels very intense. And then it kind of dips into some ambivalence, but still wanting to end things and still feeling the pain. And then it goes to another peak, which is the most intense, and then drops off. Now, I don't think it's the same way for everybody, mm -hmm. but I've talked to a lot of people for whom that is common. Mm -hmm. So when I draw that little double line and put it on a slide and explain it to a group of room, a room full of women or men or both, they start to get it. Oh, so there's this irrational 20 minutes that somebody just kind of leaves and, and something takes over. I call it a brain attack. It, you know what I call it turning off. I have my rational brain and my emotional brain at uh, childhood trauma burns the bridges between the two. So now it's up to me to try and rebuild them. To yes. Get the because when you're suicidal, there's no rational thought in your mind. It's 20 minutes of purely emotional thought, yeah. highly irrational, but it makes sense to you. Right. 
and that's and I hear the same themes. So when I when I've texted people on suicidal ideation, or even worked through them and commenting on YouTube, for example, you can tell when they're getting to the end of that irrational part because like one woman was on a bridge and I was texting her and trying she wanted to text so okay we'll text Mm -hmm. and I figured if she's texting she's not launching herself over the railing precisely and I could tell at the end she was starting to feel cold but before that she didn't feel cold and once she started to feel cold I was like okay she's coming out of it because you know, the real world is coming back to life for her. Mm-hmm. And then I, you know, we talked and I checked in on her the next day, knowing full well that she would feel ashamed. So I knew before I had to call her, I needed to reassure her that I was checking in and that I understood she felt shame. But I was glad I was there for her and I was honored that a friend of mine would reach out to me and trust me that, you know, I'm not going to blast the information and that I'm going to listen with compassion. Mm-hmm. Sometimes that's all people need, you know, like everyone's like, I don't know how to deal with someone who's suicidal. It's, it's not a rocket science. You just need to listen, really listen. Listen with empathy. Yep. Like when I go, you know, they want you when you teach it to teach all these steps. Well, Jody, nobody remembers all those steps, especially if it's a whole new concept. Mm-hmm. I want them to remember one thing and I focus on that one thing the most and that's listening with empathy. If you hear it, it sounds weird. It makes some weird feeling in your gut. And you know something's the matter. Don't walk away. Ask if they want to you know, speak in private and say things like, tell me more mm-hmm. and just listen. <laughs> I think that's the most important thing we can do is listening i think one of the things that we've learned um almost maladaptively over the years is to listen to speak you're listening but while you're listening you're already ready to say your next thing right so therefore you're not really all in listening right and as an extrovert i've had to learn that and i know there were times I feel like I wanted to impart my wisdom on my son instead of shutting my mouth and listening to him. Now, towards the end, I was better at that because I'd been to a support group for four years and you finally learned it. Um, I think that last two weeks when we didn't know where he was, I was in such an emotional state myself that I was un- I was really unable to make good rational decisions myself. Mm-hmm. And over it took me years but i have forgiven myself for missing obvious signs but they're Um, not obvious if it's not pointed out to anyone ever you know if i don't have a but that bucket available i've never seen the bucket you know i can't put it in that bucket and i didn't have that bucket so i'm trying to give people that bucket so they know and they recognize and when they have that feeling they use their ears and that's my message, is connection. I keep it simple because no, people just don't remember. But if you make an emotional connection with your audience, and I end with a story about Charles that means a lot to people, so they remember that one thing. And that's really all I want them to do. Mm-hmm. And then, important takeaway. Yeah, and then it starts to spread the awareness. And, of course, that's, you know, I want to get rid of the stigma. I want to spread the awareness, but that's the message I'm going with because people can leave there that day and turn around and do it immediately. I mean, this isn't something they have to go get a special get skill to execute, and unless they're deaf, in which case <laughs> they probably do. But that's a small percentage of our population. Mm-hmm. And again, having access to a gun so easily in the States, it, it makes it different almost for a different decision because it's so quickly with a gun you don't have to think anything but if you have to think about uh, hanging a rope around your neck or taking pills or whatever it's, it's, it's just a uh, different process access to means is is a problem um here in the states i mean it's just so easy to get a firearm yeah. and the nra used to be more focused on safety and training 
And they were wonderful at that. And they're, in fact, they're still very good at that. But it's come, become very politicized, which is very unfortunate because it's legal here. But we need some laws to restrict certain things. I mean, hey, freedom of speech is one of our things. But guess what? I can't go and just slander anybody, yeah. you know. I would be held responsible. Somebody can sue me for saying that. So there are even rules around free speech. And there needs to be some kind of rules around each of the amendments, including the right to bear arms. Mm -hmm. I don't want to people stop hunting deer. I don't like hunting deer myself. It's not my thing. But we have a rampant deer population. And hunting is this rite of passage. It's in families, whatever. I'm... You know, I I don't really, I'm ambivalent about that topic, really. But my dad was a hunter. He was a poor one. <laughs> <laughs> but he, he did hunt with his friends. But being able to get firearms is scary because 55% of the deaths from firearms are suicides in the U.S. Yeah. Not homicides. That's what gets all the attention. But the highest percentage is people ending their own lives. And, and it literally just takes a split second. Oh, and, the, you know, the thing about the other methods is there's more, like you said, there's more... There's more planning and they're drawn out. Right. And that takes time and time is your friend. You know, like if I can keep somebody talking for 20 minutes and they get to the end of that uh, ideation, I mean, I'm not just walking out at 20 minutes, but they're less likely to follow through. It's not impulsive. Yeah, they're past their crisis, their highest crisis point. Right, they're past their highest crisis point. And Jody, you brought up um, sexual abuse earlier, and I find that the friends of mine and the teens that I talk to that have suffered sexual abuse and trauma struggle with this more than any other population. And I commend you. I mean, it's the fact and the explanation you gave earlier about you have to make those connections, um, that's, that's very true. And it's very insightful. It's and, you very gotta write, work. and you got to write an article about that on Emotionally Naked. That'd be a good topic. Sure, yeah, I'd love to. Yeah, the background and how the two sides of the brain don't communicate. I did one actually on adoption too because I was interested in adoption and suicide numbers. Mm -hmm. And that's the same thing. They're huge. Four they times are, eight. They are. A friend of mine's child was adopted. And boy, child had everything going for her. It's still a complete mystery as to why Maggie killed herself with a firearm. And this was over 10 years ago. And she was 15. And that's really rare for a teenage girl, particularly back then. Mm -hmm. And I have won a fellowship from the YWCA. And my focus is going to be on the trauma and suicide piece. Because I think that that way, you know, a lot of people are focusing on a demographic or an ethnic group. But if I focus on trauma victims, I'm focusing on multiple demographics. And that's where I like to be. Mm -hmm. I, like, I like to understand it from the standpoint of sexual abuse, LGBTQ coming out, um, the effects from maybe a school shooting or some other major league trauma like that. But I'm curious what those, how that triggers people. My friend Ginger, um, she lost a son, and man, she has just really struggled since. And I just, I feel for her. Well, I definitely feel for a lot of people now. <laughs> and I try to remember I got to go home and feel for myself, too. Yeah, that's for sure. You can't fill yourself up on an empty bucket, my dear. Yes. Yes, that's a good way to put it. Good way to put it. So I'm doing what I can. Are you doing fantastic, honestly? Like I'm super proud of you. Well, thank you, thank you. Uh, some days, I, usually, if I will start questioning myself or I'm not getting enough, because I'm still building the paid speaking engagements part of my business, and you know, sometimes you're real busy, and then sometimes you're not, and you're thinking. Nobody will ever call me again. <laughs> I really like sleeping and eating indoors. I hope I get to continue that. Because <laughs> <laughs> it, it sure is nice having a roof over our heads, isn't it? 
Yeah, it sure is. So, but I keep plugging away, and I think that I think I'm going to focus on women's conferences because they're the most receptive to the message. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And now I'm just kind of figuring out where those are because that's kind of the market that's been my ambassadors up until now. I I have some dads too and some young adults and some teenagers, but it's, it's the women about 40 to 65 that seem to be my most loyal crowd. I find from the people that I've spoken with about sexual abuse that often it's not until their 30s, 35, 40, until they actually can come to terms with things. Wow. You know, I remember there being a time where that was, I believed it, but it was hard to believe. But I, I don't find that hard to believe anymore. I mean, I think you really have to separate yourself so much from what's happening that that becomes your go-to. So you put it and you compartmentalize it and you put it somewhere else. And it's just not accessible until something else happens in your life and all of a sudden it's there in front of you. And it happened in front of mine recently. The brain will protect itself. It will protect you. And it'll also damage you because it cannot keep these things in the land. Yeah. It's eventually going to come to the surface. Yeah. I remember somebody saying when they first lost a child, what did you do about the pain? And I said, well, there's really nothing you can do about the pain other than manage it. And she goes, well, you know, can you make it go away? And I'm like, there is no making that pain go away. You just have to endure it. And then you have to just manage your expectations of it. And I'm going to breathe or I just had to let it in. And I just had to make the decision. I'm not using, I'm not drinking. I'm not using a substance. I've just got to let it come. Mm -hmm. And then I, I wrote my way through grief. That's how I managed it. When it got really, really bad, I sat down and wrote on my blog. And then I published it. <laughs> it really helps so many people. It does. But at first I'm like, oh my God, I'm sharing my ugly naked grief. People are going to pity me. You know, all the stuff people think. Mm-hmm. I don't know what was driving me, but I had to be emotionally naked in public. And that's what I went with. And I'm, I'm glad I did, but I'm not really sure what made me cross that line. And what I thought was going to accomplish what I would accomplish with it. I I didn't know any of that. I just thought for whatever reason, it was the right thing to do. And I got tired of nobody wanting to hear about Charles when I would talk about him. It was awkward for them. So they cut me off and I I didn't like that. No, of course. Of course. You want to be able to keep him alive. And when I'm with girlfriends, I don't sit there and talk about him constantly, but, I refer to him because he was with us for 20 years. Like, you know. He's your son. <laughs> <laughs> right. I'm like, I'll stop talking about my dead child when you start talking about your living children. <laughs> so, and I had to work through that resentment that other people didn't understand what to say. And I had to educate them on what I was looking for. And that's what I t- try to tell other grieving parents is find that one friend Tell them what you're looking for. Um, Like, for example, there were some parents in a support group, and they said that they wanted to talk about their daughter, but they didn't want to talk about the method in which she took her life, and they didn't want that question. So they told a friend, and that friend told everybody, and then they had a house full of people, which is what they said they wanted, and nobody asked that question, and they talked about her daughter the whole time, and she was very happy with that. So having that friend, the one that says, what can I do? Uh Assign them, you know, the task of being the person to let everybody know what, what it is you want. Because it is true that every person grieving or every person that suffers defines support in a little bit different way. Uh Um, I think listening with empathy is almost always something we can do that people appreciate. Anyone can do it. You don't have to have a qualified skill. No, you don't. And people feel unqualified to deal 
with these things and you know they're they're part of life i mean no we don't get a manual for it but you know we don't have to have a manual to listen with empathy no i I think with it being such a hot topic it needs to become preventative instead of let's figure out what happens after enough with after let's figure out how to stop it in the first place because the numbers are skyrocketing they're, they're staggering jody they really I, are. I get emails from kids honest to god i got one from portugal the other day who's 12 years old what do i do with a 12 year old i just listen i listen and listen and listen and i tell her you're only 12 sweetheart Okay, you have so much life left ahead of you. You just have to grind through this, grind through it however you can. So I'll get I'll get posts from 10 and 11 up to, well, 65. Um, get a lot of young people because I have a video on YouTube. And I just say, first thing is, tell me more about your pain. You know, uh, what are you experiencing? And... Just ask questions. Sometimes they come back, sometimes they don't. The emails they typically do, because they're trying to figure some things out. Mm -hmm. And then I was working with a kid in Chicago, Illinois, and then about four months, we've been having email communication probably two, three months. And then I didn't hear from him for a while, so I thought, I need to check back up on him. And he said, you know, it was, he didn't think he was doing a lot better, but he was getting a lot of help. And I looked at his message that I got then and compared it to the last ones. I thought, he has no idea how far he's come. So I let him know that. I said, you have complete sentences. You wrote me three paragraphs, whereas before you wrote me like incomplete five word sentences. And that was it. Mm -hmm. There's definitely a difference. So whatever you're doing is the right thing. And it doesn't feel like you made progress because you're not happy yet. But you're putting the foundation in place to find joy in the little things in life, which isn't always, you know, landing an airplane. It is. No, you have to pat yourself on the back for the small accomplishments. Right. I agree. So those little goals, you know, making these lofty goals is is just not a good idea for really any of us. We need to, if we make a lofty goal, we have to make the steps Mm -hmm. and make those steps goals. Manageable and tangible goals. Right, that we can actually reach, that we don't have to wait two or three years to get to. Yeah. Because that starts to feel overwhelming and insurmountable. Oh, it does. You feel like it's just, you're never going to get well. Right, right. So when we respond to teenagers, the one thing that is recommended by American Foundation of Suicide Prevention is actually to avoid phrases like, you have so much to live for, but instead to say, tell me more about what you're struggling with and to really just ask questions. Mm -hmm. Um, Like when I started to ask, well, how long does that suicidal thinking last? Some of the kids don't know that there's like, sort of a time frame and they'll come back and say well gosh you're right it is about that length of time and just kind of knowing that there's some sort of pattern and that it's irrational thought for that period of time does help in their understanding that it that it's more of a brain attack than some personal weakness Mm -hmm. so it's something happening in your head because otherwise why would you feel that way absolutely so i sometimes that works to help them define it It, but again it depends you know depends on the person in it and for the person on the bridge that day i just had to focus on her ambivalence which was her fear that if if she left the side rails that she could suffer from permanent damage and when she mentioned that I was on it. And I said, yes, I've known, because I I do know people who've attempted suicide and are severely disabled as a result. That is one thing that has honestly kept me alive for the last five years, is fear of failure of that. And when she brought that up and she was like, well, probably, I said, I know you could very well end up like that. 
And I mean, I didn't let her off the hook with that one. And I think that is what made the difference in her case is that that fear is what kept her from following through. And she doesn't, of course, she doesn't remember it now, but it was a text conversation. So I put it in a Word document so I can kind of go back and look at it and see how I applied my training, Mm -hmm. see where I may have kind of taken a wrong turn and what I did right because obviously she's still alive. And that was, for the most part, 90% of what I did was on target, which balanced out the 10% that wasn't perfect. Mm -hmm. But let's say that I botched the whole thing. Just because I was answering her gave that a high probability that she would live. Even if I didn't use my training and I didn't do quote unquote, a great job. I always say that it's the people who don't reach out at all. Right. That's the scariest time. If you're on Twitter and you're talking about it or posting about it or something, you're still reaching out. Exactly. And then, you know, the scary thing about social media is the trolls, the people yes. that say things like go ahead and do it. Mm-hmm. And so I think that, you know, cultivating a good network of people who keep up with you, who outnumber those trolls is really, really important. And you do that really well because you've created a network of support. So if one of those trolls gets through, they can get drowned out by a hundred other people. Mm -hmm. So a troll comes up to you, you need to retweet it to all of us (laughs) because the piranha will come in. And of course, that person's probably suffering too. But that doesn't mean they can push somebody over the edge yeah. when they're teetering on the edge. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. And they have the right to do that. No, nobody does. No. And, you know, that's still pretty cruel behavior. And they'll pay the consequences of being eaten alive. Because that article that went viral, one person commented, uh, and I only got one, ne- I got 2,500 comments and there was one negative one which I was surprised because I was expecting more. And then he he said, I can't believe you kidnapped your son out of his bed. No wonder he killed himself. And I remember feeling sorry for the guy instead of angry, (laughs) which I'm so surprised I had that reaction, but I'm like, oh, dude, that was the wrong answer. They're just going to annihilate you. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Mm -hmm. Yeah. He ended up deleting his comment because, I mean, they were on him about that. Yeah. I didn't have to do anything about it. My network did for me. Yeah. It's very important to build that network somehow. It is. To build that support network. And if you don't have it, some of these small rural communities, you don't have access to that all the time. So I try to encourage people. I don't want 12-year-olds necessarily on social media, but if they're already there, find a support network. And if they're not there, you know, find it elsewhere. I would eventually like to start um, an online, very low-cost group, um, peer support through Zoom. Yeah, I think I think that would be a really good idea. And I'll even like age limit it. Like I'll have ones for under 16. So if I know there's kids, that's that. And then I can deal with the adults in another way or 18 and under and 18 and above. Yeah. Yeah. And I'm, I'm hoping to like the training is how, um, and I need more training on things like trauma. So I'm going to increase my training there and I'm going to apply to be a bereavement care provider Oh, that's cool. So I don't know if they'll be accepted because I'm not a, I have a college degree, but it's in journalism, not licensed clinical social work. But, Mm -hmm. you know, I've done a ton of workshops and group work and, um, you know, I've had some training from American Foundation of Suicide Prevention to reach out to survivors. So, you know, I do have some foundation, but you know, I don't have the licensure. Yeah, so. but the being trauma-informed is so far ahead of the game. Like, right. how many therapists I've seen that just don't do the trauma? Yeah, I'm like, and to me, that's pretty much 90% of the population, if not more than that. Um, I'm very lucky that the two that I've dealt with have both been trauma-informed. Mm-hmm. And not because I look for them that way, they just happen to be. It's... I will say in the United States, a lot of advancement has been made 
for trauma-informed care much, much faster than I had anticipated because I expected the mental health to be further along by now. Mm -hmm. But the fact that the trauma-informed care has pushed mental health ahead on its own and people have recognized that connection but everybody wants to kind of put it all in separate buckets and it's like your brain doesn't separate all that you know you you can't you know you can treat all of it but i find that you go get addiction treatment they won't they don't want to deal with mental health i'm like well that's kind of the underlying reason somebody's substance in the first place you have to deal with that piece or they're going to relapse the day they leave your rehab. Yeah, so. <clears throat> so I really wish that the they wouldn't get paid unless they prove some level of outcome, you know, mm-hmm. uh, at some particular milestones. Because as it is, there's so much money in it. There's a lot of opportunity for scams mm-hmm. to, with desperate parents like I was. Yeah. Well, anything I, to help your kids. Right. Anything, anything. And I think that, I think that you are lucky in that your dad, your mother really loved you. And I know she was, she was sick for a long time, right? Yeah. Six Um, years. Yeah. That's a long time, but at least you had that love Mm because that's that's not always an advantage everybody has. No, for sure. It's hard to, at the time you don't see that, but when you look back. Right. Because when I see kids like foster kids that have never had that, I, you know, it, you struggle with will they ever, will they ever feel a sense of connection, or will they always feel that sense of unworthiness somehow? I think, like for me personally, it's just been lifelong. My trauma started so young. That's right, it did. That there wasn't time not to be traumatized. Yeah, and I, I wonder. You know, I know why some are more vulnerable. Like you see, like here in the States, maybe somebody who's illegally come across the border is much more vulnerable to sexual sexual abuse because if they report it, they'll be deported. Mm-hmm. So they have to make that choice. But I, I just wonder why some people get targeted and how they, you know, or is it that first victim... And then after that, you know. I felt personally like I was wearing a shirt that said, come molest me. That's right. what I felt like I was wearing because all of my um, molestations were outside the home okay. by multiple perpetrators. So then you just put that on you because if multiple people are doing something, there's definitely something that I'm doing wrong. Right. But I don't want to say a child is doing something wrong. Right. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. And being a magnet to attract that. But what is it? Or it could be as simple as predators when they sniff their prey and, you know, they I just... Think they can smell vulnerability. Like, you know... I, I think I think that's it. They just know because they're predators and they thrive on that, mm-hmm. which is just the sickest thing. Yeah, it's, uh, something that needs to be put forward in terms of they need to put some money into research right you can't just leave it like this forever it's ridiculous it is ridiculous and we need to put as much money into that as we are putting into keeping people on the moon with roast beef dinner yeah exactly <laughs> i'm just like some of the stuff you see get funded you're like for real yeah but you know i, I don't think we're gonna be able to change all that I just want to change my little corner and I'm hoping, you know, I'm hoping the book does well. I certainly have worked at it hard enough and there's nothing else quite like it out there. I think it will because it's um, going to be written so personally that people are going to be able to feel like they know Charles. Right. Well, that, that they will because it includes his music. And that's what hit me. That's how I ended up understanding it as well as somebody who's never had the ideation can understand it Mm -hmm. is because that music made me feel it. Even if that's not quite feeling it, if you know what I mean. Yeah, I get it. Because you can't really know without actually stepping in those shoes, but you do, you get as close as you can. Mm -hmm. And I had to understand it. I had to understand why my son took his life because 
you know, I knew it just, I knew he loved us. And that was, that was the conundrum. Mm -hmm. This person loved me so, so much. And at first I thought he did it to me and he didn't do it to me. He did it to himself because he didn't feel worthwhile. You run out of hope, you know, yeah. and that's essential. His pilot light of hope went out. Mm-hmm. And then that's that's what happened to him. Mm-hmm. And after he died, oh, God, holding on to that hope, little piece of hope. And I would just tell myself, you're going to survive this. It's never, ever going to be as bad as when you first got that news. It's never going to feel that awful again and through that. You can make it through this next hour. Like someone took a big, made a big scar on you and it scabs over. And when you, the scab falls off, it's still all tender, pink, sensitive skin. Exactly. That's a great analogy. So yeah. And then there's this tree that I follow and I saw it one day and it was damaged by a storm. And at the top of it was a strange heart shape made out of branches so the lightning hit it in such a way that it made this heart shape and it looked singed and i thought sure they would take down this tree but they left it up there and over the years branches have grown around the singed part and you can look in the winter you can see it but you can look up in the tree and you can see all the leaf and growth and beautiful tree but underneath you can still see that singed heart so the wound is still there and the tree has found a way to move forward and live mm-hmm. so that's that's kind of my thing is to pass that tree and take a picture of it and use that as my metaphor mm-hmm. every time i go to that park i got to go by the tree to take a picture and my husband knows he, he, he doesn't say let's go this way this time because he knows i want to go that way and take a picture of the tree <laughs> There's always the little things that, uh, that keep us um, happy after the painful memories are ceased. You know, right. you want to be able to remember the good things as well. Right. And I have to learn that, that grief is going to be part of my life for the rest of my life. So I had to incorporate grief into my life. Mm-hmm. And at first I thought, well, maybe there'll be a time where I don't think about him every day. I don't know why I thought that. But I did because I've never been through this. and. I think about them every day. Of course. And I always will. Mm -hmm. Um, But it's just knowing that there'll be painful times and that right now that grief, even in the sadness, is my connection to my loved one. And so it's not really my enemy anymore. Mm -hmm. First, it was something I wanted to get out from under and push it away because it was so intense. And now... It, I'm okay with it. I'm okay with the rhythm. I'm okay with that feeling of sadness when it comes because it gives me an opportunity to remember just a really special kid who reached out to others all the time. I mean, he was always there for other people. With your book, he's still going to be there for other people, which I think is fantastic. Yeah, I think that's probably what I like the best about it. <laughs> And, you know, like I said, I'm going through all these fears of nobody will ever buy it. Well, I'll buy one. So you got one sold for sure. And I'll post it. So I'll get my friends to buy one too. Yeah. And what I want everybody to do is when they buy it, post a picture of themselves with the book and put it on their social media. Because I want them to show that they acknowledge the subject. And it, it just, it's their way of saying, I'm here to talk. I'm here to listen. I'm willing to learn. Mm -hmm. And the more people I think we get to do that, the more, the more we can start to bring down those numbers. Yeah. Because we are doing things and they keep going up and that's very disturbing. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. At some point they got to go down. No, they really do. Like it's, it's, there's no words for it anymore. No, we've lost more people to suicide in the last year than all of World War II. I mean, that's just ridiculous. Yeah, yeah. And, you know, we, the addiction and this together just are two things that we, no matter how bad it got, we couldn't get enough attention around it. But uh, I, they're all connected. 
all connected. You know, like no one is an alcoholic because it's fun. No. <laughs> right? You're an alcoholic because you don't want to think. You don't want to feel anything for that period of time, and that is your coping mechanism at the right. time. And I knew a lot about that growing up because I had an aunt who was a serious alcoholic who, who died from alcoholism about, you know, she fell and hit her head. And I loved her. And I wanted her to know I loved her. And the disease just took over. Mm -hmm. And that, you know. But what I found out later is that she had been suicidal several times. And nobody ever told me. And the way I found out, my father's still alive, but the, uh, my mom was cleaning out his office. And in the office were some old letters. And he had written her psychiatrist and it talked about all my aunt's suicide attempts. And you know, that would have been good information for me to have. Yeah. <laughs> that depression ran in my family, both sides. And that on one side of my family, somebody had been suicidal. And but I didn't find that out till afterwards. No, those are the days where you don't speak. No, nobody aired their dirty laundry, and they're still hesitant to do so. Mm -hmm. So, well, hopefully, with people like you working, it's going to help spread the word. Well, and we're partnering today, and we partner a lot of times, so I think that helps too. Those yeah, partners, for sure. For sure. And you know, I I do make sure I connect up with certain people um, to extend those partnerships to find out what they're doing, so that when people ask me about certain things, I can refer them to a resource. Mm -hmm. You know, if somebody starts to talk about sexual trauma, you know, I've uh, referred them to you, and then your article, uh, self harm safety box on my site is very high ranked article and gets reviewed a lot at the end of that article as a suggested you know more on that topic mm -hmm. and then there was another one you wrote and they go to that page a lot too so they're getting this chain of articles of people and i can see in the statistics how they'll go here and here now once they go to your site you know, I'm assuming they're reading that and looking at other things. So I don't have your statistics, but I do see they're kind of following, you know, mm -hmm. who they may get or find support from. That's good. It's always good to have a human resource instead of a book. Right. Because I know people go to Dr. Google. Oh, my God, yes. And that's what I'm good at. Your self-diagnosis. Oh, my God, I have a brain tumor. No, it's a headache, idiot. Take a towel off. <laughs> Well, I actually did have a brain You, tumor. yes, I should bad example with that. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I remember they said, well, what do you think it is? Because I had a crooked tongue. And I said, I think it's a brain tumor. And they were, they were like, ah! <laughs> And then it came back, <laughs> brain tumor. And then I got a call from the receptionist who laughed. And she goes, I can't believe what I said to you. And I said, don't worry about it. We had a good laugh at the time. And yeah, I bet. That's awesome. Anyway, my friend, I'm going to wrap this up, but I'm going to ask you if you would come back on again because we didn't even get into your TEDx talks or anything. I would love to. That would be wonderful. Perfect. Perfect. I would really like that. So give me a couple of weeks to get these up and going. Okay. And then I'll send you a calendar again. All and, right. Uh, we can get you booked in. That sounds great. Thank you, Jody. No worries, my love. It was so nice talking to you. It was. It was great talking to you too. And Thanks. Go build that audience, girl, and I'll try to help you by posting this one on my site. Thank you for sharing Charles with me. Okay. I feel like I know him a little bit better, so I feel I feel good blessed about that. Okay. All right. Go okay. enjoy your day. Yeah, you too, love. All right. Bye. bye. Well, as we wrap up the show, I would like to give a special thanks to our guest, Anne Moss Rogers, for sharing her time and her story with us. If you have enjoyed today's show, please make sure to subscribe to the podcast so you never miss another episode. If you have any comments or questions or wish to be a guest on the show, you can message me at OneLastKick71 on Twitter, Jody B B E E on Facebook, or through my website, JodyBetty.com. Links can be found on the podcast website. Thank you so much for spending your time with us. Hopefully we can help to eliminate or at least reduce the stigma around mental health. Until next time, take care and be well.